is a reading from the Notebooks by Maria Voltorta, 1943, November the 28th. Jesus says, The characteristic sign of my birth in the world was the light. Events are often characterized by phenomena which you call and explain as fortuitous coincidences, and they are instead the presages, the calls of God, to attract your attention, diverted towards a thousand more or less necessary things, to an event which will mark a period in the world's history, or in an individual's life. I was the light, and the light preceded me, surrounded me, announced me, and led me, and led the pure in heart to me. I told you, footnote, in the dictation of November 27th, that it seemed that a light was emanating from Mary as she passed on the poor means of transportation of the poor in recollection along the roads of Palestine. I told you on other occasions, footnote, for example, in the dictations of June 10th and September 30th, that those who have God in themselves emit, not just spiritually, vibrations of light and perfume, for the inner treasure spreads out from the living reliquary bearing it and is perceptible to other beings. You then said, This person has something special within. What a face! What a manner! That of a saint! Mary was the all-holy woman, and bore the holy of holies. She thus possessed the perfection of human holiness, already so deified as to be almost equal to that of her God. She possessed the divine perfection, which had robed itself in flesh, asking her to nourish it with her virgin blood, to form it, to be its refuge for the nine months of its formation as man. God took nourishment from Mary. The God-man is made of Mary, and they took from my most lovable mother the physical and moral characteristics of sweetness, gentleness, and patience. The Father left me perfection, but I wanted to take on the physical robe and the most precious moral robe of character of the blessed one who was my chaste nest. Since Mary is the holiest of all the creatures that have been on earth, she emitted holiness no longer as a closed face, from which molecules of perfume filter out, but as a flaming star releasing ethers and rays of supernatural power. If the, bas if the Baptist jolted in his mother's womb on receiving the wave of grace em emanating from Mary and was left sanctified by it, the emanation had been, had been so powerful as to pass through the barriers of the flesh beyond which the fruit of Zechariah and Elizabeth was being formed to become my evangelizer. Gospel means good news and John gave men the good news of my being among men. I thus do not err in calling him my evangelizer. <coughs> this is for the quibblers about the word. Those who approached Mary directly could not be left without repercussions. She left behind herself a wave of active holiness, and provided hearts did not reject grace, those approached became the ones predestined to sanctity. When everything concerning man is made known, you will see that among the first followers of the Son of Mary, there are many who had even a casual relationship with her, remained washed and penetrated by the grace which spread out from her. You will then know many miracles worked by this woman of mine, who was all beautiful and all grace. Mary now converts the hardest hearts and saves the most obstinate sinners, but the cycle of her power, in compensation for all, for all I have received from her, did not begin on the day when, as a star going back up to heaven, she rose to rest again on my heart and make paradise more beautiful for me, make it more complete, for now she was there, the mother whom I, had, I have infinitely loved, and to whom I owe everything as a man. The sanctification of the peoples through Mary begins at the moment when the Spirit made her the mother, and the Son of God took on flesh in her most blessed womb. Joseph was filled with this emanation to the point of being made thereby almost like the woman full of grace. Blessed tears fell from the just one over the f joy flooding him, the mystical joy of the contemplator bending over a miracle of divine manifestation. Adoration and silence were the characteristics of holy Joseph, venerating respect for the blessed one whose natural protector he was, and love, the first chaste love of a spouse, love as that of men ought to have been, according to the Creator's thought, love without the sting of sense and the mire of malice, a love at once natural and angelic. For in the souls of Adam and his children, according to the thought creating them, there was to be the angelic purity of the spirit mingled with human tenderness. And like a flower opening sinlessly from the stem bearing it, so without the worm of lust, love was to arise in spouses and give children to chaste marriage beds. To be chaste does not mean to prohibit union. It means to fulfill it while thinking of God, 
who makes two reasoning animals into two lesser creatures? And has God created the male and the female without introducing malicious thought into them, and did not place in their pupils a fleshly light to reveal the flesh to the innocent? So spouses ought to make marriage a holy creation, gladdened by cradles, but not sullied by lust. The spouse who is honest and loving in a holy way seeks to become like the other spouse, for those who love tend to take on the likeness of the beloved creature, so that marriage, when well understood, is a mutual elevation, for there is no one who is completely wicked, and it is enough for each to improve one point by taking as an example the other's good side in order to climb up the stairway of sanctity, competing with one another, like a plant putting forth a branch higher than the preceding one, and rising and rising towards the sky. Such is conjugal and individual holiness. Today it's one virtue, tomorrow from this virtue another, higher one sprouts forth, and from the human virtues of mutual forbearance one rises to the peaks of supernatural heroism. Joseph, the holy and chaste spouse of the holy and chaste woman, like a child alongside his teacher, learned day by day the science of being like God. And since in his heart, as a just man, nothing was an obstacle to grace, day by day he took on the likeness of his beloved teacher, thus resembling God, whose most perfect copy Mary was. In the holy night that roused Joseph, praying so forcefully that he reached the point of being surrounded by a mystical barrier, isolating his soul from the exterior, was the light. In the grotto, first barely illuminated by a little fire of dry twigs, which was already fading out from a lack of fuel, there had spread a peaceful light, which was gradually increasing like the radiance of the moon, which, first covered by veils of clouds, then gets free of them and descends clearly to make the earth silver. In the luminosity was Mary, still kneeling, for I was born while she was praying, but lowered back on her heels. It was Mary that, with tears and smiles, kissed my flesh as an infant. Not many words then, either, the usual Joseph, and the presentation to him of the fruit of her holy womb. The family was the first reality redeemed by God, reconstructed as the Eternal had conceived it, two who love one another in a holy way, and in a holy way join to bend over a newborn babe, and in the kiss they exchange over that cradle there is no savour of lust, but mutual gratitude, and the mutual promise to love one another with reciprocal love, which aids and comforts. When the first shepherds came in, they found the two holy ones still united that way by love and adoration, and that tenderness devoid of carnality, which, unfortunately, is not seen except in the eyes of a father, was so visible on Joseph's face that he, a mature man, seemed to be the father of the virgin and of the child. The light was now on the earth, and from the open heavens the light descended in waves of angels, nullifying the luminosity of the stars on that serene night with their paradisiacal splendor. It was not perceived by the learned, the rich, and those sated with pleasures, but it was plain to the humble workers who were doing their duty. Duty, whatever it may be, is always sacred. The duty of the king who signs decrees is not higher than that of the farmer who tills the earth, or of the herdsman who watches over his flock. It is duty. It is the will of God. It is thus always noble. It thus obtains the same reward, and the same supernatural punishment. And it will not be wearing a crown or holding a withe that will save you from punishment, or, you, or deny you reward. God manifests himself to those who do their duty, thus doing the most holy will and takes them as witnesses to his wonders. And God was manifested to the shepherds, and the shepherds were called to be witnesses to God's wonder. In the light, which had now become brilliant, for all of heaven was over and in the grotto, grotto Emmanuel was visible to the second ones to be redeemed, the workers. For God came to sanctify work after the family. Work, given as a curse to man after Adam's sin, was becoming a blessing, since the Son of God wanted to become a worker among men. The light had come into the world, and the lovely grotto and the limited countryside of Bethlehem were not enough to contain it. The light spread out to the east and the west, to the north and the south. Not to the guzzlers and, gluz and gluttons did, I, did it speak by its appearance. It did not speak words to the revelers with its vibration. It spoke to those who, pure in heart and longing for truth, humbled their highly cultured minds at the feet of God, and felt themselves to be atoms before his holiness. 
To the powerful who made their power an instrument for spiritual conquest, the light showed itself and called them to adore it with the sparkling that filled the four corners of the firmament. The powerful, for God came to sanctify the powerful after the workers and the family, and with the powerful science. But God does not manifest himself to the power, powerful who are wicked, or to the scientists who are atheists, and cover them with blessings, but to, to those who make their gift of power and science a means for spiritual elevation, not for abuse or negation. God is the king of kings, too, and God is the teacher of teachers, too. The light found many teachers on earth, but only to the teachers desirous of God did the light come a call. It is always that way. Grace works wherever there is a desire to possess it, and the more intense the desire for possession and to be possessed is the more it works, to the point of becoming word and presence. Before the king of kings, guided by the only thing which is worthy to be a trace of God, the light, the powerful came from remote lands, the first group of the numberless ones who over the centuries would undertake the mystical march to go towards God, not the powerful of Palestine, not those who believed they were repositories of God's secrets and decrees, and those decrees and secrets were rendered incompre incomprehensible for them because there was no holiness in them, and the signs of heaven and the works of the book and the words of the book were, more, were mere meteors and mere word, words without any more supernatural meaning, but those distant. I had come as light into the world, light for the world, light in the world. I was calling the world to the light, the whole world, and I call it. I have been calling it incessantly for twenty centuries. I do not cease to make my light shine over your darkness. If you were able to raise yourselves over the barrier of haze you have spread over the world, you would see the divine sun, always glowing and benignant over men, over all men. Nor is it any wonder if those who are farthest from Catholic Rome now precede you. Gaspar, Melchor, and Baldazar, from three points of the earth, came on the patient backs of camels to the light of the world, not seen by the compatriots of the Son of Mary. Africans, Asians, and Southerners are coming to the cross, which you have rejected, and they will surpass you. On the last day, when time and men are illuminated at every point and side, the unpleasant gap left by you, Catholics, for centuries, will be seen, while the others, idolaters and heretics, fascinated by the Christ, the Holy Lord, will have poured in with their souls rendered virginal by grace. How many dark movements in the civilized world! It is your shame and your punishment. You never should have permitted, and never should permit, the light given to you, first of all, to be rejected and denied by you. The darkness is killing you, and you do not want to abandon it. From it there come, like hateful animals of the night, all the evils tormenting you and feeding on your blood and your agony. You no longer want me. You no longer understand me. You no longer know me. Not even those of my house know me any longer, and the many diseases of the flesh and the mind have made them so ugly that I find it hard to know them. But on this first Sunday of Advent, which announces the coming of the light into the world, I entreat you, O children, if you no longer dare to look at me as Redeemer and Judge, because pain brings fear and justice brings terror to your degraded souls. Look at me as a little infant on Mary's lap. A baby cannot have anything but caresses and smiles, and I have these for you. Have mercy on my nakedness and my poverty, not involving clothing and money, but love, your love. I do not want gold or incense. I want only your love. I want it because to love me and to know me is life and truth. As Mary conceived me by the work of love, so I want to conceive you by means of love. Mine is living and active, but yours too is needed. Come to me and receive me into yourselves. I will open torrents of light and grace in you and make you become children of God as I am. Blessed are those who receive my light. I will be in them. I will dwell in them, in their spirits, for the word does not need clay dwellings, but living dwellings. He wants the spirits of men as his dwelling. The glory of God is revealed to those who receive me, for where I am, the Father and the Spirit are with me, and the glory of the Lord is fully and joyfully displayed to them, and grace is their life, and like the sun from the height of heaven, divine fatherhood, brotherhood, and charity are upon them, and provide foretastes of blessedness. Mary, in her ecstatic luminosity, offers me to your love. Bend your brows to love made flesh. He left the heavens to take you to the heavens. He came into war to bring you peace. 
For three days the rivers of ecstasy have been opened for my soul, and I rejoice at the vision. In addition to the words, my soul has become whiteness and light, for the whiteness of the Virgin Mother and the light are in me. Glory be to God for his goodness, which grants that his servant may see what the angels saw, and floods my soul with his peace. The radio at this moment is broadcasting the Agnus Dei from Sunday Mass, but I have seen the newborn lamb sleeping on a lap of whiteness, <clears throat> and he is lovelier than the loveliest music.